anyways, without further ado, um, AJ, how did you start getting in? Because I know you've been talking about this and ranting and raving for it for about a month now or maybe longer. Um, what got you interested in this med? Deep into diabetes research, we're seeing an increase in the importance of hormones and glucose uh, regulation in the body. And so this is kind of just a solely hormonal uh, drug that is being used for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And it's it's novel, honestly. Yeah. So for those of you who are not familiar with, um, you know, a GI, GIP and what that is, um, it's one of the two main, you know, incretins or incretins, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, that we think about. And, and in, in incretin is the incretin effect is basically the idea that giving glucose orally will stimulate a better um, uh, insulin response from the body than it would be if you gave glucose intravenously. Um, and it's be because of the uh, release of GIP and GLP-1 um, in the intestinal tract and their uh, downstream effects on the beta cells in the pancreas to release that insulin. Uh, and so GIP is the, the side of things that we haven't really explored yet, um, or well, you know, the medical clinician world has not explored because we haven't had any available products. Um, but Tazepatide is going to use both GIP and GLP-1 and use both sides of the incretin uh, world in order to uh, facilitate a better response than we've had previously, based on the data anyway. Yeah, it's very interesting. And for those who are very familiar with the incretin effect and have heard of GIP, you might be saying, I thought that it had a different name. Well, turns out, for some nonsense reason, it's known as by two different names, actually three different names. Mm -hmm. So gastric inhibitory polypeptide, gastric inhibitory peptide, or glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. That's all of favorite. those are... GIP. They're all they're all abbreviated as GIP as well. So I think if you look at um, some of the trials and maybe even like Lily's website and stuff, they like the long form one. I think they, it just makes it sound more official. But it's the <laughs> glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. But all of those, um, I feel like the one I had heard was gastric inhibitory peptide. But all of them are the same. And uh, yeah, so it's definitely. Uh you know, for what it lacks in uh, FDA approved products, it makes for up for in uh, letters in the name. <laughs> but uh, this is a drug I definitely think will be approved this year. I wouldn't be surprised um, if not sooner than later. Um, but I guess we'll kind of start off just talking about some of the, uh, you know, background you know, biochem physiological effects that GIP have. Um, and, you know, we'll, we've, we've gone over GLP-1 uh, many, many times on this podcast. So GIP, I don't think we've ever even really mentioned. Um, I've heard you say it. Okay. So somewhere when you were probably talking about a GLP-1, you were talking about GIP. Perfect. Yeah. Right on. So this is the – just to recap GLP-1s, um, if you think about its effect on the pancreas, you know, we're going to get an increased release of insulin, and that's after you've had – a meal involving carbohydrates, you're going to get an increase in glucag or I'm sorry, a decrease in glucagon secretion from the pancreatic alpha cells, um, because once we start secreting insulin, if glucagon levels then go up to kind of counteract that and you know create that homeostatic ba uh, balance, um, we offset some of the effects of the insulin and some with diabetes, we don't want that. So we want to suppress glucagon if possible. And also, um, you know, it can help with beta cell uh, proliferation and hopefully uh, increasing the available healthy cells that are able to produce said insulin in the first place. Um, and then we know its effect uh, as far as gastric emptying, where it slows that down, um, slows down um, the ability to kind of break down those carbohydrates and hopefully not uh, – the blood sugar uh, is a, basically a, more of a rolling hill than a uh, sharp spike. And then it also can decrease appetite um, through not only the gastric emptying um, process but also through uh, its effects on the uh, actual feeling of hunger um, where GLP-1 receptors binding in the hypothalamus can uh, increase the uh, activity of pro-opioid melanocortin neurons uh, firing. AJ, did I get it right? Pro opio melanocortin neuron. Bam. Nailed it. Nice. Word. I should I should mention that I found a little extra info on the name, since that's just what I'm going to talk about the whole time. Yeah. But it, the old name was the gastric inhibitory polypeptide or peptide, which is probably why that's what we had heard. But they felt like that was describing the function of it incorrectly, because I used to think that it was – it decreased secretion of stomach acid to protect the small intestines from stomach acid and reduce GI motility, which they now attribute more to secretin, which is a hormone where – 
we've probably heard of. So since it does what Mike just said, and it is primarily related to insulin secretion, they renamed it glucose dependent, not renamed it, but a lot of people prefer the name glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, but kept the abbreviation GIP to prevent confusion, but it may have just created more. <laughs> there you go. And so those things I was just referring to is, uh, on, that's the GLP-1 side. So GIP, it's going to have similar effects. So you're going to have increased release of insulin from beta cells whenever um, you have carbohydrate you know, in the diet. You consume those, you're going to get that beta cell release of uh, insulin. You're also going to get that beta cell um, proliferation in order to create more healthy cells. However, the, one of the things that is different about GIP is that um, when it's euglycemic environments or um, even in hypoglycemic environments, you actually get an increased release of glucagon, which by itself, especially in a euglycemic environment, by itself is one of the reasons why GIPs as a standalone monotherapy agent haven't come to fruition as of yet. Um, we want to suppress glucagon in a lot of cases with type 2 diabetes. But because this is together, we are offsetting the glucagon activity that the GIP1 has at euglycemic um, levels, and then the GLP1 is suppressing that glucagon so that you're kind of shutting down or at least limiting the effects of glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis. And um, when the person, if the patient were to have a hypoglycemic event, then that increase in glucagon activity could actually come into um, into play and be a, a benefit in that case. So that's why the GIP and GLP-1 from a pancreas standpoint seem to be an effective combo. Um, also, one of the kind of unique things with GIP-1 is it actually, or excuse me, GIP, not one. There's no one after it. <laughs> um, with it's GIP, G- nothing. I know. GIP, zero. But, so it's uh, not even zero. Okay. It's just well, nothing. Just just nothing. Right on. <laughs> Different than zero. It, me and AJ had a whole debate about this. <laughs> um, but uh, GIP uh, affects the increase of uh, bone uh, formation and basically can kind of help to store some of that free calcium um, in the uh, bone itself and actually increase osteoblast activity and decrease osteoclast. And so you actually can get some, some bone formation, which who knows, maybe we'll end up using this in not just diabetes, but also as a tool towards osteoporosis in the future. Hmm. AJ, have you seen anything about that? I have. And that's, uh, that's one of the weird things about these hormones is that they've got a lot of receptors expressed in a lot of different places. <laughs> and uh, one thing that I think Cole may be excited to hear is that there's expression of receptors in the tongue uh, as well as the bones and uh, fat cells and, and different things like that. And so they will increase uh, taste sensitivity as well as increase uh, bone resorption or decreased resorption, increased deposition, as well as fat deposition uh, when you're utilizing that glucose. That is exciting to me because as we were talking about before the podcast, and I think I've mentioned before, since I had COVID, I had lost my sense of taste. Now it's started to return, but it's extremely blunted. So if I had a way to improve my taste, I would be, Boom. I would be very appreciative of that. So just, you never know, maybe we'll inject you with this stuff. Just give me some GIP. Maybe. Just give me some GIP. 